All right. Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you for being here on behalf of the Rudolf Steiner branch of Chicago. Uh, I'm, I'm grateful for your interest, and I'm especially grateful, too, to our, our presenter today, uh, Mary Stewart Adams. Um, I will briefly introduce her uh, as I let people in and then hand the reins over. Uh, we are hoping, uh, planning for it to be about a two hour presentation or less um, with ample time for questions and answers. And we are recording this. All right, so Mary Stewart Adams is a star lore historian and the host of the weekly, weekly public radio podcast, The Storyteller's Night Sky. In 2011, she established one of the world's first international dark sky parks. And in 2021, published the book, The Star Tales of Mother Goose. Mary met the work of Rudolf Steiner simultaneous to encountering ancient star wisdom in the 1980s, which was galvanized into a life path through encounter with astrosopher Hazel Straker in 1995. Mary serves on the general council of the Anthroposophical Society in America and as a board member of the Great Lakes branch. And uh, yeah, now I will, I will hand things off to Mary. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you so much, Jonathan. And thank you everyone for being here once again on a Saturday afternoon with what is perhaps one of the most sacred topics in anthroposophy. I hope to do it justice and also hope to not just be reciting a bunch of quotes from Rudolf Steiner that all of us have access to. What I'm really interested in is weaving together the ideas and some of what I'm going to present today is, um, comes from research that I was called to do in the 1990s by a dear friend of mine, Eve Hardy, who crossed the threshold in 2007. And also in trying to imagine what's happening in the current star picture. And so the title for today is The Season of the Dead in Three Acts. And that was, it's really to help me to give, uh, to attempt to give this content in a digestible form. So I'm going to start sharing my screen right now. I'm hoping that everybody can see that. And then we'll get started. So first and foremost though, I would like us to take a moment now that we are together in dedicated time, even though we're not necessarily in dedicated, well, I guess we are dedicating our individual spaces by agreeing to come together at this time. And the, um, the beauty of the technology allows us to join at this moment, but then we also have the singular responsibility of addressing the space that we find ourselves in. And at the risk of it becoming a cliche, for me, it's really important at the beginning of a talk through this medium to pay attention to the directions, to the east and to the west, to the north and to the south. One could even say to the within, the without, what's below my feet as earth, above my head as stars, and to really get this sense that as someone striving to understand the human being through spiritual science, that cognition of the directions is inherent in that, and that there are different forces streaming from the different directions. And while we can ac have access and a seeming connection with one another through the technology, the, uh, the directions are not necessarily expressed or, um, what's the right word? confined to themselves in this technology. So I just want to be mindful of that. And particularly because now we will be lending our thoughts and our hearts to those who are across the threshold where the directional forces are something that are experienced quite differently. And so I guess we could imagine that in a certain way by meeting in virtual space, we have potentially uh, an experience or something that could be analogous to what it's like to experience it the, the directions are being beyond direction in space. I don't want to get too abstract right there, but just to have that sense. And then also given the sacredness of the topic to take a moment and hold in our hearts those that would be nourished by this work and that are called to help us as we make our way through this season, through the cycle of the year, through this time in history, Okay, 
So first and foremost, I want to point out in the first stage of what we're going to talk about where we are in the star picture. So overhead right now, what is one of the most prominent regions of the sky is the constellation Taurus around which I've just drawn this red circle. So you can see that Taurus is above the celestial equator, which is that straight line. And it's one of the constellations of the zodiac right along the ecliptic. This is a really dynamic place in the sky right now because of things that are happening, which include the retrograde motion of the planet Mars as well as the total lunar eclipse that will be visible across North America that's going to happen on Tuesday, November 8th. So I am going to touch on that, but also just to, um, this is what's visible to us in the evening sky, this region where we find the constellation Taurus, which is rising up at about nine o'clock in the evening in the east and then moving overhead while the earth is turning east and it looks to us like the star picture is going toward the west. And then the day blind stars, those stars that we aren't seeing in the sky belonging to the constellation region of Scorpio. So the sun is starting to move through this region and I accidentally tapped my, my keypad twice. So you saw this arrow, maybe you saw this arrow that was moving toward the region of Taurus. So we have to imagine in this map that we're moving from the right side to the left side. Typically in English, we read from left to right. But so when we imagine entering this region of Taurus, which is connected, I have learned through my friend, Lynn Stull, who's a therapeutic eurythmist, that in Taurus, we're dealing with will forces. And so I think it's really interesting to just consider phenomenologically that as, as the sun is moving through Taurus, as things move through Taurus, it appears to us that they move from what would be the, the shoulder region or even the, the heart region of the bull up through the horns. So from the heart to the head. So when I contemplate this in relationship to the will, it's very interesting that to imagine that will forces are not necessarily coming from clear day wake thinking, but rising up from the heart to the head. And then when we look at the opposite region of the sky where we have the scorpion, which is traditionally related to uh, our crossing over the threshold into this season when we're celebrating and honoring loved ones who have died and coming into the time of the year when we have the festivals of the dead, that the sun seems to move across the threshold. So from the front end of the scorpion toward the heart. So whereas with Taurus, we're moving from the heart toward the head region, with the scorpion, it's the head from the head into the heart. And so while Taurus is connected with the will forces rising up in the human being, Taurus, uh, Scorpio is connected with the thinking forces. So how the thought then comes down into the human form. And so this is just a, just a kind of a setup to give us a sense of, all right, we're not just looking at inanimate objects in the sky, but that there are forces streaming, they stream in a particular direction. And depending on the time of year when we're encountering something in the sky picture or knowing that the sun is moving through a particular region, the, the directional forces really seem to matter. And so coming across that threshold of Scorpio in this season is coincident with our coming into the festivals where we're celebrating and honoring those who have died. But I also want to just start by talking a little bit about this eclipse that's coming toward us on uh, November 8th, which is Tuesday, which is the election day in the United States. And so this picture on the left-hand side is a detail from Abrams Planetarium Sky Calendar, which shows the position that the moon will be in when it's totally eclipsed. So it's that kind of grayish black dot that's just below the center of the, of the image. And you'll see that um, that's the moon. And so the moon will be at full phase and at about 5.59 a.m. in the Eastern time zone, Eastern standard time, the moon will be at maximum eclipse. And so this is when the moon is moving through the deepest part of the Earth's shadow. So what's happening during a lunar eclipse, um, actually, let me back up. What's happening is the Earth is, you know, the light of the sun is shining toward the Earth and that causes the Earth body to cast a shadow into space. We only see that shadow really well when the moon moves through it and shows it to us. Now the moon is a celestial body that very much is hidden from our true uh, ability to understand what it is. Rudolf Steiner uh, describes how the beings of the moon are the most deeply hidden in the cosmos and that the moon as a body is not showing us anything about itself. What it does is reflect. So it's reflecting all available celestial light. So the sunlight, the starlight, planetary light, and 
reflecting to us our own shadow when it moves through that shadow. So it's not telling us anything about itself. It's just, a, it's, it's reflecting. And it takes a great deal to get behind that kind of mirror that the moon would be to understand its mystery. So on November 8th in the morning, when the moon comes to exact full phase, it will be at the deepest part of the earth's shadow. And you can see that little cross that's just above and left of the moon, indicating the position of the planet Uranus. So Uranus is much further away from us than the moon, and you would probably have to have tel a telescope or at least some high-powered binoculars if you wanted to see Uranus at the moment of total eclipse. Um, but just to get that sense that what's happening is moon is directly lined up with the earth and its shadow, and then well beyond it, Uranus is standing almost also exactly in line. And then if we were to look toward the sun, which at six o'clock in the morning in my time zone, it won't be up yet, but if I could see in the direction of the sun, just beyond the sun on its other side is the planet Mercury. So this is a really interesting lineup of Mercury at what's called superior conjunction with the sun, the sun face to face with the earth, earth casting its shadow being fully reflected by moon and Uranus standing way in the background, almost as though they're in a straight line. So just contemplating that can really give rise to a sense that there's something sounding out in the celestial picture. So I'm not going to talk right now so much about the astrological aspect of that. I do want to bring an imagination to what we can, what I think it would be healthy to imagine in relationship to this phenomenon, but I just want to point out that it's happening and also to draw attention to something that Rudolf Steiner had to say about what's occurring, or at least what ancient initiates understood was occurring when a lunar eclipse happens. So first this, the old initiate entrusted his questions to the rays of will which stream up from the earth towards the sun. And he received the answers from the rays of thought which come down on earth, on the earth from the moon. So this is from his Human Questions and Cosmic Answers, which was a lecture series given in June of 1922. And he's talking about the relationship, the different relationship between our engagement with sun and with moon. And so there is this idea that on the rays of the sun, something is streaming up from the human being toward the sun and then something streams back toward us on the rays of the moon. But when an eclipse occurs, this situation changes. And that actually, uh, he goes on in this lecture to describe how in under normal circumstances, when there isn't an eclipse, that the dead are actually traveling on the rays of the sun back into the spiritual world. And that new souls coming to birth will stream toward us on the moon beams, which is just really a lovely picture. But then when there's an eclipse, we can have this experience as though the unbridled will forces or something of the human being streams out into the cosmos and does not have the sunlight to meet it, to kind of digest it and work through it. And so that this is like the safety valve on a steam engine, the steam is let off. And so that the consequence of this activity is diluted, you could say. So it's less contained. And so it gets out into a wider arena where it's then taken up by the larger cosmos and eventually it will come back to us. It will stream back to us as something that we have to deal with as karmic necessity, but that when there's a solar eclipse, it's almost like a, a gift you could say that something is released. When there's a lunar eclipse, something else is happening. And during a lunar eclipse, because the moon is fully reflecting our shadow to us, it's not reflecting the celestial light, it's showing us our shadow at this time thoughts can stream down in darkness. And he goes so far as to say that these thoughts then, evil thoughts can be taken up by those who are preparing themselves to receive them. This is kind of confounding, or at least it was to me the first time I read it. Why would you prepare yourself for receiving evil thoughts? But living with it as a contemplation and looking at the relationship of human being to earth and earth to its celestial environment and this kind of inflow and outflow, a picture starts to form about the necessity of these experiences and how when we live on the earth, we're in what Aristotle referred to as the sublunary world. We're below the moon sphere. So we're actually in the moon sphere. And rhythmically, we will have an engagement and an experience with moon, not only when it's new, not only first quarter, not only full phase, but when we have these eclipses, which will happen every year, twice a year, where our relationship to the celestial environment can shift. So 
I'm not going to read out these quotes, but it's on the slide so that when the, uh, if you want to access the recording, you can get to that. But what I think is really important in considering what is it that we are receiving in the, uh, potentially experiencing and encountering in the shadow of an eclipse. It's an important to know the role that the sun is playing and the role of the sun being in our cosmos. And this has to do with the forces of mediation. This is a picture that I took at uh, autumn equinox when Mercury was standing at the point of balance. I'm going to come to that in the third act, but just to have this quote again from Rudolf Steiner, this is from the spiritual individualities of the planets where he's describing that the misused forces of destiny in a human being can be are, are as though taken up by the sun and that the sun works it through until these forces can be used again to come to freedom. And there's an interesting distinction between in this lecture about the spiritual individualities of the planets where Rudolf Steiner is describing how our experience of the planets between earth and sun, so that would be moon, Mercury and Venus, that here we have an encounter with the forces of destiny. But those planets that are further away from us than the sun, Mars, Jupiter and Saturn, are aligned to what he calls liberating forces. So if we just think about the makeup of our planetary system as we understand it now, Moon, Mercury, and Venus are the only celestial objects, objects apart from uh, comets and falling stars that actually can get between the Earth and the Sun. And so that these planets, both Mercury and Venus can get to the other side of the Sun, but they can also come between Earth and Sun. Moon can be, be between Earth and Sun and can get to the other side of the Earth, but they all have this space between Earth and Sun where the forces of destiny are weaving. Once we get beyond the sun sphere, then we have Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn, which will never come between the earth and the sun. And that when we move beyond that sun sphere to these outer planets, now we're dealing with the forces of liberation. And this is going to become significant in the prayer that I want to share that comes from the karmic relationships lectures. But just to have this sense potentially that when we have a lunar eclipse and thoughts are streaming down in darkness, and human beings are undertaking activity, that if there is misused forces of destiny, it's like ash that the sun takes up into itself to reform. And there would be a rhythmic handing off of this to us that we could look at through the individual biography, but then also through the larger course of human history. All right. I'm hoping that this is gonna generate a lot of questions. So, take notes and ask as we go at the end. I'm gonna to have to wait till we get to the end. All right, so act two. So just wanted to set that up. We've got an eclipse coming and now we're going to look at where we are in the cycle of the year relative to the topic. So this image was created by uh, uh, Lisa Lily White from her website called The Smart Happy Project. And it shows uh, the cycle of the year together with the, the equinox points, the solstice points, and the cross quarter points. So the cross quarter points in the cycle of the year are the halfway point in a cycle. It's a really dynamic time when we have a turn. So you could say that at the equinox points, equinox means equal night. So day and night are of equal length. So this is a point of balance. And then we have the solstice points. Solstice means the standing still of the sun. So we have this stillness. So equinox balance, solstices, stillness. And when we come through the cross quarter time, we're turning from the onset of a season to its fulfillment. And so there's this moment of turn that takes place. And the moment of turn that occurs in the winter is oftentimes referred to as candle mass or in the United States as Groundhog's Day. It's coming around the 1st of February. It's about 40 days after Christmas. And so this has to do with the mysteries of inner light. And when I was a child, it was always confusing to me that if the groundhog saw its shadow, why that would mean there would be six weeks more of winter, because it seemed to me if the sun was shining, then that would mean that winter would go away and nobody was there to explain it to me. And so I had this idea that it's about that, that time of the year is really about the inner light and about holding something. Particularly if we look at the story in the gospel of St. Luke, about the presentation of the Christ child at the temple 40 days after the birth. 
and the prophet um, Simeon, <coughs> excuse me, Simeon and, oh gosh, and Anna perhaps, they prophesy over the child and these things that Mary hears, she holds within her heart. So there's something about the gesture of Candlemas that has to do with holding the light within. And potentially if it comes out too soon, there won't be the strength to fully bring it to birth. That, that the, the seeds that are being planted then that will be realized in the harvest, they need that strength of containment at that time of year. And then on the opposite time of year, we have what is known as Lamas, probably the least known of the cross quarter days. That word Lamas comes from loaf mass. And it has to do traditionally with the harvest of the first wheat and that that would be ground into flour and baked into bread. And then a ceremony would be held where the bread is offered at the sacred site to bless the rest of the harvest. So it come to abund uh, an abundant fruiting. And so Lamas is happening around the 1st of August. And this has to do with the maturation of the crops through this celebration of the outer light. So we have these cross quarter days up across from one another, the mysteries of the inner light, the mysteries of the outer light. And then we have in the spring, May Day at May 1st, which is a celebration of fertility and life springing forth up out of the earth and out of the human being, the fertile nature of the human being being celebrated. And then at the opposite time of year where we find ourselves right now, the fulfillment of life at its end in the mysteries of the dead. And so this is the all hallowed time. And so it's at that point in the cycle of the year. So we would be moving clockwise through the year if we took this image. <clears throat> and so right now we're at this point where we've crossed, the sun is approaching the front region of the scorpion in the sky, where it's crossing over this threshold where the star Deshuba is, which is sometimes described as the tree of light that stands in the garden of life in the midst of the abyss, and then crossing into the underworld toward the heart of the scorpion. So bringing the thought across that threshold into the darker time of year, where the outer light is no longer illuminating the world for us, but we find our way through an expression of inner light. And so it's at this time of year then in many different traditions where there's an honoring and a celebrating of loved ones who have died. So it's opposite the time of year when it's the fertility and the springing up of the new life. And now it's really drawing our thoughts and our attention and our hearts toward those who have crossed the threshold. And so in his lectures, on the um, karmic relationships in volume three, Rudolf Steiner points to, the, the lecture begins with a description of instinct and its difference in the animal kingdom as apart from the human kingdom and how instinct in the animal is actually streaming from the group soul. But because the human being has an individuality and its own soul, instinct is not coming from a, a group consciousness it's actually coming from the experience of repeated earthly lives. And then from this setup of looking at how instinct is operating in the human being, he begins uh, to enter into a lovely description about the forces of destiny in the human life. And then how in death, when a human being goes across the threshold, what becomes of those forces of destiny that have woven through the biography of the human being. And the first stanza of the prayer Memento Mori which is this exhortation to follow the further lives of those who have died across the threshold into the spiritual world is to recognize that the first stage of what happens is that in the weaving of the ether, the human being's web of destiny is received. It is as though it is breathed in by the third hierarchy of angels, archangels, and archi. And this is taking place as the soul is expanding out into the celestial environment after at first leaving the physical body and the etheric forces are still there, which gives life to the thoughts that we've had. Rudolf Steiner make, de describes how thinking when we're in the physical world, we have dead thoughts, but that when we die and the etheric body for a short period of time goes with us into the spiritual world before it expands and dissolves into the cosmic ether, it gives life to the thoughts that we were having. And at this time, the third hierarchy is receiving the web of destiny. And then in the second stage of what's happening with the human being is then the experience of the consequences of our activity. But now we're not seeing it from within the self looking out. It's as though we're seeing it from behind or from the perspective of the other. And so it is in then into the astral world, the just consequences of a human being's earthly life die into the second hierarchy, 
the exousiae, the dynamis, and the curiosities. And at this point now, the human being has expanded out almost as far as the sun sphere. So we have this experience first of the forces of human destiny that have woven through the, the biography of the individual, driven in, in, in large measure by the instinct that derives from repeated earthly lives, and that that is breathed in by the third hierarchy after we die, and that then we begin to experience the just consequences of our deeds, and that this kind of dies into the second hierarchy, and then reaching the sublime mystery of the, third, the first hierarchy, that in the essence of our deeds, the essence and the honest creations of what we have really achieved in life, that this is then received and resurrected in the first hierarchy of thrones, cherubim, and seraphim. So I was first made aware of this prayer, uh, not in the context of the lecture in which Rudolf Steiner mentions it, which is in the Karmic Relationships, Volume 3, it's the second lecture there that has the title, The Forces of Karmic Preparation in the Cosmos. I was given an assignment of study by my dear friend and mentor, Eve Hardy. Um, those of us that were in a study group together, she suggested that we go and find at least two or three different translations of this prayer. So this was the 1990s, like mid 1990s before uh, everybody had personal computers, there weren't smartphones, there was no Google. So you weren't getting online to find translations at that point. And it was around the time of November. And what happened to me in trying to find uh, the translations, I bumped into something else. It wasn't a translation, but it was a correspondence of these stanzas of the Memento Mori with the calendar of the soul verses that are included in the calendar of the soul for this very time of year when we're dealing with, when we are moving through this season of honoring the dead. So I just want to show us that. This is the Hans Pusch translation. So verse 32 that comes here in November. I feel my own force bearing fruit and gaining strength to give me to the world. My inmost being, I feel charged with power to turn with clearer insight toward the weaving of life's destiny. So this is me as a human being on the earth and the call through the calendar of the soul to become aware of the forces that are operating, waking and sleeping throughout the cycle of the year. We've come to the month of November, the festival of honoring and celebrating loved ones who have died. And there's this sounding out of the experience of the weaving of life's destiny, which seems very much to echo what is spoken in the first stanza of the Memento Mori that here is where we're dealing with the third hierarchy. It's in the weaving of the ether, the human being's web of destiny is received by angels, archangels, and archi. So when I first encountered that, I was like, oh, this is, oh, I'm, I'm hearing the same language, at least in translation, translating into English. And these, the, the calendar of the soul, the original calendar of the soul was first published in for the year 1912, 1913. And this lecture about the Memento Mori was given later in, what was it, 1922? So 12, almost 12 years later. But there's this harmony and this consistency that in approaching this time in the cycle of the year, we can be sensitive to not only how when someone has died, the first stage of their experience has to do with the third hierarchy and their web of destiny, but that we also in life can become aware at this time in the cycle of the year of our working through that and weaving in the web of destiny. And then the next calendar of the soul verse, verse 33, I feel at last the world's reality, which lacking the communion of my soul would in itself be frosty, empty life and showing itself powerless to recreate itself in souls would in itself find only death. And so then I heard in this, the second stanza of the Memento Mori, which has to do with the consequences of my life dying into the second hierarchy. And that this is an experience potentially of both the good and the negative experiences that others are having as a result of my activity. And that something of that is taken up as though it were to die into the second hierarchy. So this sounding out of this verse in the calendar, the soul calling our attention to that experience while we're in life, and then also 
<clears throat> recognizing the process that the dead are going through that has specifically to do with the same thing. And then the next verse from the calendar of the soul. Hang on, I gotta move my screen around so I can read things. <clears throat> In secret, inwardly to feel how all that I've preserved of old is quickened by new risen sense of self. This shall awakening pour forth cosmic forces into the outer actions of my life and growing mold me into true existence. And now this I think is echoed in the Memento Mori verse. In the essence of their deeds, the honest creations of a human being's earthly life are resurrected, new risen in thrones, cherubim and seraphim, these mighty cosmic forces that are pouring forth both toward the human being on this side of the threshold in life between birth and death. And also our attention is being drawn to how they are working how the dead are having an encounter with this in the time between death and rebirth. So I think that this is a really lovely harmony and it's worth our paying attention to in this season that as we contemplate the dead, we can get very specific about where they are in their journey. And again, in this lecture is where Rudolf Steiner describes how the amount of time that we spend in sleep in, in life between birth and death is about the amount of time it will take us to review the life at, in, in between death and rebirth, and that we can have a very specific thought about at which level of the hierarchy is the human being working in that rhythm after death. And so I imagine this as a lovely weaving between the living and the dead. And there's an escort that accompanies us when we are having this encounter with the threshold. And in ancient tradition, that escort has the name of Mercury. So this is an image of the mercury fountain that's in the rotunda of the West Art Building at the National Gallery of Art in Washington, DC. This is just the base. Mercury is at the top of it, car, uh, sculpted in bronze. But I wanted us to just really have that sense of how that caduceus is formed, where mercury is weaving across, it has this gesture of weaving across the threshold that we weave our web of destiny and we are having this experience that we can awaken in, a, in, a, in the perspective of spiritual science, looking at the true nature of being human and that across that threshold, we can be cognizant of how the dead are having experience of the third hierarchy receiving that web of destiny. And then just this crossing back and forth, a contemplation of the self and life, a contemplation of the time between death and rebirth and the weaving and working of the hierarchy and the really sublime role of the energy of Mercury, what we would call Mercury. So again, I'm gonna show this picture and then also this really lovely quote from Ida Wegmann from a piece that she wrote called The Mystery of Earth. Truly listening to another person is an act of extreme selflessness. When two people come together in freedom, recognizing each other in spirit, the old traditional symbol, the mercury staff, becomes a perceptible reality in spirit. A portion of each person's eye organization leaves the body, submerges in the other person, and then returns to its own body. This is just really a lovely picture, not only of the encounter of self with other in the physical world, but particularly in this time of the self in life on this side of the threshold with one who has died on the other side of the threshold and how in our thinking and in our feeling and in our willed activity of honoring and celebrating those who have died, it's as though we make this crossing over that threshold and this weaving begins to happen. And so I think potentially this has to do with the reason why Mercury is the one that is escort of, to that experience. I just wanna give us a moment to kind of live with the feeling of that. And now, uh, because I would like to draw attention to what the planet Mercury, astronomical Mercury, the closest planet to the sun is doing in our sky. 
Okay, and I also need to check the time. So far, so good. All right, act three. So I'm gonna show this picture again of the cycle of the year, remembering that now we are at the time of All Hallows. So actually between All Hallows and moving toward winter solstice. And even though it looks like winter solstice is at the top, when we get to this winter solstice moment, we are at the full in breath. So it is as though the earth has fully breathed in its forces and has fully self-contained, has in a certain respect, cut itself, isolated itself off from its celestial environment so that now it can contemplate that environment from as though without. When we're in the summer solstice mood, it's as though earth forces has, have breathed all the way out into the cosmos. And it's kind of a dreamy, sleepy quality, not a self-aware or awake time. But now we're coming to that really wakeful inner time between all, actually between autumn equinox and winter solstice. So we've crossed that point of turning. It just happened on November 1st, and now moving into that deeper in-breath and wakefulness. But what I wanna draw our attention to is that point of autumn equinox. And so we could consider that a point of balance, one of two points of balance in the cycle of the year. And what happened this year is that because Mercury made one of its retrograde at the end of the summer and into the autumn, it actually went over that point of balance three times. And what's significant about that to me this year, 2022, is that that point of balance was noted by Rudolf Steiner in September of 1913, when he undertook the ceremony of laying the foundation stone for the first Gertianum. And so of all of the activity that's going on always in the celestial environment, Mercury is the only planet that is indicated in the document that was laid with the foundation stone. This I think is really remarkable and is worth our attention. A spiritual initiate is performing a ceremonial deed and making note of the position of the planet Mercury. Astronomical Mercury, the planet closest to the sun, which was at the moment that the foundation stone was laid, occupying the point of autumn equinox, the point of balance. The equinox had not happened yet because equinox happens when the sun gets to the point of balance. This was a couple of days ahead of time. There had been five days earlier, a total eclipse of the moon and Mercury was at superior conjunction. So this lineup of moon, fully immersed in earth shadow, earth face to face with sun and Mercury at superior conjunction. The same kind of lineup that's coming toward us on November 8th, Tuesday, total eclipse of the moon, earth, sun, Mercury at superior conjunction. This is, I mean, it's just, to me, it's beyond remarkable. It's absolutely beautiful. Who knows if it was anticipated? I think definitely in preparing for the ceremony of laying the foundation stone, Rudolf Steiner chose the time, chose the date. It was indicated by Mercury. If we take what Ida Wegmann has to say about what can happen to us when we enter into conversation with one another, through the power of positive listening, we speak, something of us goes out into the other and it weaves back toward us, now imbued with the other. And so in laying the foundation stone with this description that the microcosm is being laid into the macrocosm. This is a threshold crossing. And so the guardian and the escort across that threshold is called as to witness this, this mighty inscription that is being made of this foundation stone being laid. So it has about it this quality of giving us a foundation for moving back and forth across that threshold, not only in life between birth and death, and then being cognizant of the lives of those who are in the time between death and rebirth, but with one another in life, with one another across the threshold, a foundation for really being able to encounter and awaken to that reality. So I just wanna give us the dates that Mercury went back and forth across that point. It first came to the point of balance on August 26th. Hopefully you keep a journal so you can get back and look to see, was there something that might be notable that is connected to this motion of Mercury. Then again, on September 22nd, just a few hours before, uh, before the exact moment of equinox, which is also just a remarkable picture. Here we are 
in the 100th anniversary year of the fire that destroyed the first Gertianum, Mercury comes back to the point that it occupied when the foundation stone was laid upon which that building was built. And it comes to that spot in retrograde exactly between Earth and Sun as they are at their equinox. And then it came for a third time in direct motion across that point on October 10th. So this, I think, is a beautiful, beautiful picture to have in mind, in heart and mind as an anthroposophist at this time. That, and I've, and I've asked myself the question, does it matter to Mercury that it's at that point of balance? Does it matter that uh, this inscription that was made by a spiritual initiate on the earth into the spiritual world, Rudolf Steiner says, such is the writing of the stars, our own deeds inscribed into the cosmic spaces. So Mercury going back and forth across that spot seems to call to the human being to awaken and to be aware that this deed has been undertaken that allows us and gives us the foundation for recognizing how we are speaking to the stars. And so now to bring this right into the moment of what's happening in the star picture right now as an opportunity for us to be aware of the consequences of what we are either awake to or not awake to right now in our speaking with the stars. So again, this star picture or this picture from Michigan State University of where the moon is gonna be at the moment of eclipse, lining up with Uranus. So it's just below Pleiades, the seven sisters, which are the most storied about region of stars in the night sky. And then the moon is going to move on and it's going to pass by Mars, which is right between the horns of the bull, which according to Ernest Hemingway is referred to as the terrain of the bull. So he wasn't talking about the night sky. He's talking about actual bulls on the earth and bullfighting and, and running with the bulls and how this is kind of a, a really heightened place of sense organ for the bull right there between the horns. And so when we look in the night sky picture right now, the moon is going to be eclipsed in the region of Taurus just below Pleiades. And then it's going to move on and pass Mars where it's moving retrograde back and forth across the bull's terrain. This I think is a really beautiful picture, particularly if we activate it in our imagination relative to the ancient Greek myth about what goes on in this region of the sky. And the story belongs to the overtaking of the ancient gods, the Titans by the Olympians. And so the, the, the chief god of the Titans is Kronos, known to the Romans as Saturn. And so it's prophesied to Kronos that his children will overtake him. So when they are born one by one, he devours them until Rhea figures out that all of her children are being devoured and she takes Zeus and she hides him in the region of the constellation Auriga, the charioteer, where we have the bright star Capella. And that star is known in the mythology as Amalthea, which is the she-goat that suckles the infant Zeus. In the Pleiades, which is the star cluster that marks the left shoulder of Taurus, the bull. These are also referred to as the seven sisters. And their role in this story is that they transform themselves into doves in order to bring nectar to Zeus. And when you look at the star picture, it's not shown right here, but Capella is almost right up, straight up above Pleiades. And so you could imagine it would be pretty easy for them to go straight up. But there's some mystery of their passage through a region called the Simplegades, which are the smashing rocks that they have to pass through. And I imagine that potentially this is a gateway that they have to go through in order to have this transformation from sisters into doves so that they can bring the nectar to Zeus. And one of them is always lost. And so Zeus is continually replenishing the number of the seven sisters. And so when you look in the night sky at the region of Pleiades, it looks like a smudge, but if you look at it with a telescope, you see that it's much more than seven stars, but with the naked eye, you can at least discern seven there. And so the imagination I have in the star picture right now is that when the moon in the region of Taurus is totally eclipsed and we are experiencing our shadow, and we've got Mars retrograde right there back and forth several times over this terrain of the bull, which is the region that the Pleiades, I didn't say this part, it's as though the Pleiades have to go through the horns of the bull to get up and to Ariga and to Capella. All right, so the, the one horn of the bull has the name Alnath, which means the budding one. This is the one that's gonna knock into you. The other one, which, which would actually mark the left horn of the bull is that has the name Tianguan, which means celestial gateway. 
All right, so I imagine that Pleiades, they are moving through the horns of the bull, trying to pass through that celestial gateway, but occasionally they get butted and trying to, at that point, moving through that gateway, transformed into doves, and then they fly up to Capella to nourish Zeus. And now Mars is right there. So as Pleiades are trying to make that pass, you could say, through that celestial gateway, they're encountering a guardian. And that guardian right now takes the form of Mars. So the imagination that I have is when the moon is fully eclipsed in the region of Taurus, it's an indication that it's time for going through the passageway, but we have to find it in the dark and recognize that there's a guardian there. And this guardian is Mars. So I've drawn this picture, it's a little bit busy, but just so that you can see it. And here's Pleiades down here, marking the left shoulder of the bull and that they would fly through or enter through this region of the terrain of the bull, transform into doves to get up here to Capella to nourish Zeus. In the Hindu tradition, Capella is associated with Brahma, the creator God. And my friend Marty Seuss just recently shared with me yesterday, Brian Gray's research that connects potentially this star Capella to the Nathan Jesus soul, which is really just a beautiful, beautiful imagination. And also something quite lovely to hold as we have this experience of this time in the cycle of the year, when we become cognizant of the processes of of the dead, not only in contemplating those who have died, but looking at how Rudolf Steiner sets this up through a description of the memento mori, which gives us an experience of the third, first, second, and first hierarchies, how we find that a resonance and an echo of that in the calendar of the soul verses that correspond to this point in the season of the year. And then to consider that as the sun is moving through this kind of underworld region of the scorpion, then the moon reflecting toward us from Taurus, our shadow. It's like now is the moment to make that pass, but human being, you must find the passageway in the dark and pay attention. You're going to encounter there the being of Mars. Now, what is the being of Mars? There's a great deal of mystery connected to Mars, but the one thing I want to lay emphasis on is a description that Rudolf Steiner gives about how we engage with the celestial environment. And again, in putting it in terms of what was understood by ancient initiates, that one would lay prayers into the lap of the sun. So I pointed to this in the first act, that one would give prayer to the sun and the answer would come back from the moon. And he goes on in this description to say how in working with the sphere of Mars, it's no longer prayer, but now it is mantra. Mars understands mantra. And the response that comes back to us from Mars when we have approached through mantric rhythm will be received from Venus when Venus and Mars are in a particular configuration. And then he goes on to describe how in ancient cultures then with working with Jupiter, this is where the blood sacrifice would take place and the response would come from Mercury. So just to have that in mind as someone on an anthroposophical path, which I once heard Ernst Katz say means that first and foremost human being, you are a meditant. And what you meditate are the, the, the mantras of the first class in particular, if, that's, if you're a member of that first class, but that this mantra lives in your heart. And that when you encounter the being of Mars as a guardian at a passageway, potentially that's what will rise up. It's how we approach the threshold. This seems to be the question to me. How, oh human being, are you going to pass through this time in which you find yourselves? I mean, there's a lot of sensation around this eclipse happening on the same day as the election. There's a great deal happening in the world. I think that this calls for a, 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 an attitude of positive listening across the threshold and recognizing what's rising up from the heart toward this potential guardian of Mars that's going to stand there kind of completely unveiled when the moon is eclipsed. So I also just want to show us what's going to happen then because coming in December, now what happened in 1913 when there was the lineup of lunar eclipse, Earth, Sun, and Mercury, that happened on September 15th. And then five days later on September 20th, was when Rudolf Steiner laid the foundation stone, Mercury had moved ahead from that, that position of lining up with everybody. And then it moved ahead to the equinox point. So a point of balance. 
This year, on November 8th, we have moon totally eclipsed, Earth, Sun, Mercury, not forgetting that Uranus is out there in the picture, and Mercury is going to move ahead and come to the point of solstice. And that will happen on the 6th of December, and the very next day, within, within just a few hours, Mars will come to its opposition with the Sun, which is when it's closest to us. And it's right there in the terrain of the bull, between the bull's horns. So this, to me, it, it, it has a quality. Mars has, has gone three times over the balance point at equinox, which is the position it occupied at the laying of the foundation stone. It's going to line up with Uranus, moon, earth, and sun. And then it's going to move on to solstice, to stillness. And then Mars is going to lean in as though it is asking us a question in the quietness of the spirit. Human being, what have you to say to the stars? This, I think, is essential for us to listen to right now because there's a lot of noise, a lot of noise in the world. And then just to finish, uh, I also wanted to show us that Mercury is going to make its final retrograde in 2022, beginning on the 29th of December. And on December 31st, 2022, exactly 100 years from the fire that destroyed the first Gartianum, Mercury will be retrograde in the exact same degree of the zodiac that it occupied on December 31st in 1922. I just want to take a breath right there because this is just such a beautiful picture. Mercury has gone three times over the position it occupied when the foundation stone was laid. And at the close of this year, when we come to the 100th anniversary of the fire, it will be in the same position that it occupied 100 years earlier on the same day. So Mercury, which is this escort that takes us across the threshold in our encounter and experience with loved ones who have died in the positive listening to one another. It's how we are able together as a community to move through the experiences that we have in the world now, but it really very much requires this presence of mind and steadiness of heart as we approach the passageway during this, potentially during this time of a total lunar eclipse, knowing that Mars is a guardian right there in that, in that terrain of the bull, um, to really, really be cognizant of that. <clears throat> and then I would like to close with what I think is a really lovely poem by Emily Dickinson, and then hopefully there's time for question and answer uh, afterward. We grow accustomed to the dark when light is put away, as when the neighbor holds the lamp to witness her goodbye. A moment, we uncertain step for newness of the night, then fit our vision to the dark and meet the road erect. And so of larger darknesses, those evenings of the brain, when not a moon disclose a sign or star come out within, the bravest grope a little and sometimes hit a tree directly in the forehead. But as they learn to see, either the darkness alters or something in the sight adjusts itself to midnight and life steps almost straight. Okay, so I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. Okay. Thank you, thank you so much, Mary. Yeah, thank you. I hope that there are questions. Um, I hope I didn't go too fast, that it held, held together for everyone. I trust so okay too. If it takes a moment to come up with a question or to have a comment. Um, but please know that I, I very much appreciate the back and forth that can happen, uh, but I also don't want to force it. It should come naturally. Thank you. I, uh, I have a comment um, or a question. Um, could you just say some of your own words about how you connected Emily Dickinson's thought to what you had said previously? Um, I, it, it, to me, calls forth an image of leaving the home of a friend at night. Okay. Make your way in the dark. And how do we make our way in the dark? And I bump into things. Ah. And so she says, you, you know, you can even hit a tree. 
But then right. it's like, wait, wait, I'm, I'm upright on the earth. I have forces and I have capacities and I can make my way almost straight. Doesn't have to be a straight line, but I can get there. Okay. So I really have this experience that, that yeah, it's going to be in the dark. We're going to have to find our way in the dark. We're making our way towards something that is light, but, at, but it, it still yet is dark. And how do we do that? How, how, how do we do that with one another? So th to me that it speaks to that. And the fact that it starts with this relationship of a neighbor and holding up a lantern to say goodbye, mm. I'm going to make my way out into the dark. And I might bump into things. That's the human condition. We're gonna bump into things, but with goodwill we can, and, and a sense of the uprightness of being human. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for asking. Yes. Yeah, it looks like Amy, you have your hand raised. Go ahead. Uh, you're muted. Yeah, there you go. Can you hear me, Mary? Now I can hear you. <laughs> Hi, Mary. Thank you so much for your talk. This is this is just fantastic, and it explains so much. The last forty hours of experience, <laughs> of course. So thank you for bringing it so consciously, beautifully aware. Um, so it's not only living in the heart and soul, but can also live with just a conscious stay awake. Thank you so much for that. Um, I was on the phone just prior to this call with a dear mutual friend that we have um, speaking about Capella. And we were both um, very present with uh with buddha's activity in mars and the compassion that less there that lives therein and mm -hmm. really softens one could say um could you speak do you have anything that you could share in relation to buddha and compassion as we go through this this threshold yes i would be willing to share and, and thank you i mean it was a notable omission but it, when preparing it's like how i don't much mean to put you on the spot <laughs> thinking of yeah. genders and quotes and right so my understanding of this oh no 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 i no i i, I really don't mean to put you on the spot it's okay it's okay i'm willing to go there yeah. try to not be long-winded but uh, I don't want to assume that everybody on, on this call understands the relationship of the Buddha with Mars. So briefly, just to share that at the time of the scientific revolution, which seems to really be instigated by the Copernican thought that the Earth is in motion around the sun like the other planets, even though this didn't originate with Copernicus, the way he's bringing it at the begin in the 1500s is according to how Rudolf Steiner describes it, really devoid of spiritual content. And so it starts to cut off the capacity for the human being to understand their relationship to the spiritual world. And that this is a crisis. And that at this time, the leading spiritual initiate by, that we know by the name of Christian Rosenkreutz has a meeting in the region. Uh, I think at first he says in an undisclosed region. And that at such a meeting, not only do those who are incarnate in the world attend, but those who are in the spiritual world that still have the earth as uh, the focus of their attention and activity. And to this meeting, the being of the Gautama Buddha comes. And at this meeting, which to me seems quite mysterious, and I've contemplated this for a lot of years as perhaps a lot of us have, how are they able to figure out that this fallen thought is coming from the Mars sphere? I mean, it's recorded that Copernicus was looking at Mars when he was struck with this idea. Um, he wasn't using a telescope, not that that would make a difference, but Copernicus is doing his research with the night sky before the invention of the telescope. But so at this meeting with Christian Rosenkreutz, it is understood that a crisis has happened in the Mars sphere and that souls that are incarnating toward the earth, coming from their star, picking up the formative forces of the zodiac that form the physical body, the rhythmic forces from the planetary spheres that give, um, give the rhythm to the inner organism of the human being, that as souls are passing through the Mars sphere, there they are encountering the fact that a crisis has taken place and a fallen thought is potentially being picked up. And this thought has to do with the way of describing our planetary system such that the human being can no longer find access to the spiritual nature. 
And in recognizing that this fallen thought is coming from Mars, a decision is made at this meeting by the Buddha that he will take his realm of activity from the earth and potentially from the time in, a, in the experience of a human being between birth and death and move his sphere of activity to Mars so that now it can work with the human being between death and rebirth. So this is a tremendous change moving from the influence and the experience or engagement of the Buddha from birth to death to the time between death and rebirth. And so in contemplating a mantric engagement with Mars, in part, this is, I think, informed by the activity of the Buddha with Mars, so that we don't enter into what could be the strife and the aggressive and potentially negative confrontational aspect of Mars fallen energy, but that we can approach it with an active engagement that is informed by mantric rhythm that has it about it the, the, the fullness and the exp uh, potentially striving toward the compassionate fullness that the Buddha represents, that this is how we can communicate with that being that is standing there as though at this threshold, this, this celestial gateway of Mars, or excuse me, of Taurus. And it's really interesting that one of the stars of Taurus there, the horn is the budding one, which seems to have this quality of confrontation that is oftentimes aligned to Mars astrologically. And on the other side, it's the celestial gateway and Mars is standing right there. Like if you like, and if you think about Taurus in relationship to the human form, where it's the larynx and the horns could be imagined, not sitting on top of the head, but as the eustachian tubes in the human being, that this speaking and hearing or potentially speaking and listening, that the larynx is forming in the vertical and the upright and the cartilage that forms the, the ear in which we hear is in the horizontal and that these form gestationally in the human being at the same time. And that if this marks the two stars that are the bull's horns, Mars is like moving right here in our being. Like what, it, what is that? that? That listening, that thinking, that capacity to lead with compassion. To lead with, well, something that the Dalai Lama said, to meet everything with meditation. Like the sensation around eclipse or around election or around everything that's happening in the world right now, to meet it with meditation. As a, as a healing gesture. So Amy, I don't, I don't know if that answers the question. Maybe it touches some of it, but it is something worthwhile. If you wanted to read about this specific description from Rudolf Steiner, I know of it as one of the lectures that's included in the book, The Secret Stream, about Christian Rosenkreutz and Gautama Buddha. Great friends. And I smile no, because thank you. You, chemical you, wedding now. Thank you. Yeah, right, right. Thank you for addressing it. And I think, um, I think you already addressed it through your poetry and such and that, you know, we're going to bump into the tree. We're, yeah. we're doing our work and we're going to bump into the tree and we try. And maybe that's where the compassion comes in for yes, ourselves yeah, and for ourselves people. as well. Yes. I mean, the last two days, just compassion just keeps coming up again and again at, you know, quote unquote accidents or oops or should have been done. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and, and also, so. I mean, I've been, I've been going out. I, I have the companionship and sometimes care of my mother. She's 89 years old. And the other morning we were up early. It was about 6 a.m. And in the Eastern time zone where I live right now, the sun is not over the horizon yet. Dawn hasn't even broken yet. And I took her by the hand and said, we're not turning on any lights. We're gonna find the door in the dark and we're gonna go outside and we're gonna to talk to Mars. We're just gonna go out and have this experience. And so I recommend that as an experience, like between now and Tuesday, like go do it. Like, what is it to find a door in the dark? And maybe we all do that. I mean, I never turn a light on at night. I'm really light sensitive. I like the dark. And so I just make my way as best I can. It can be dangerous. And that's part of it in that poem by Emily Dickinson. You might smack your head on a tree. And so I'm not suggesting to anybody that you be careless, but actually what does it take? What does it take to find our way in the dark? And knowing 
that if I'm speaking about that metaphorically, I have this historic description of a deed that was undertaken by Rudolf Steiner of laying a foundation so that I could find my way through the dark. A foundation that is visible both on this side and that side of the threshold. It's there. And as he describes at the conclusion of the Christmas conference on January 1st, 1924, that the proper soil in which the foundation stone as a meditation is to be laid is the heart of the human being. And when we think about Taurus and Scorpio, how with Taurus we're moving from as though the heart toward the head and Scorpio from the head toward the heart. I mean, it's, it's just this really lovely imagination that I've got an opportunity right now to, it's being activated in the star picture and I can activate it not only in my imagination, but in my experience. And I see that Pat asked a question in the chat um, about what uh, suggestions about what to do on New Year's Eve. And this is, I think, motivated by the fact that Mercury is going to occupy the same position that it was in uh, in 1922 on New Year's Eve. And that what we've been doing in the Ann Arbor community is assigning ourselves the task of really trying to create a way to rebuild in the inner imagination, the first Gertianum, how to get hold of the elements there, um, the orientation in the directions, the uh, form of the columns, how many columns are there in under the large cupola, under the small cupola, where does the sevenfoldness express itself? Where is the 12 foldness? What's on the ceiling? What's depicted in the windows? How to really call forth the picture as much as I can, um, at, but to, because, uh, It, lit, it, it, it exists in the spiritual world. As Rudolf Steiner said, after the fire, the building could be taken by fire, but what the Gertianum is can never be taken. And to find that as fully as we can with one another at this time, if the foundation for that building was laid into the earth and then it was built on the earth and then it burned down, then the foundation was laid into the heart of the human being. So that building arises when we come into communal relationship with one another. And I want to bring as much as I can into community of that building to facilitate our recognition that we are as human beings on the earth expressing the sacredness of this temple that would support the realization of our spiritual nature. We need this now more than ever because of the things that are happening in the world. Anthroposophy, I've just said this again recently, and I'm, I'm wholly biased toward it. Anthroposophy has the substance that the world needs right now. It's urgent. And as anthroposophists, as those who are interested in this path, those who would identify as anthroposophists at this time, there's a certain call from the spiritual world and also a responsibility to be this in the world. And so for me, it's really fundamental steps. I asked myself the question six months ago, could I build the Gertianum if I needed to? Like, could I really call it forth even in just without external prompting? Do I know what it looks like? How it was, what materials were used? What direction it's oriented? Where, where things were, what colors were? It was all so specific. So I'm uh, working in community toward that. and. We haven't really spoken aloud what our plans are for New Year's Eve, but for me, I think it will be a silent vigil in community and really trying to vision and, 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 and enter into what I believe really exists in the spiritual world, which is this, gosh, trying to find the words for it. Um, yeah, this temple that supports a realization of the, the true nature of being human. Okay, I see, let's see. Kathleen says, please talk more about Brian's reference to the Nathan soul. Okay, mm, big question. I'm gonna answer it as best I can. And also I want to um, honor Brian's work and research. I, I don't want to diminish it by not being able to rise up to how beautiful it is. So I'm gonna give you my abbreviated understanding. 
So this has to do with the mystery of the two Jesus children. And the two Jesus children can be described as I'm gonna go down this path. There is the Nathan Jesus soul, the birth of whom is described in the Luke gospel. And there is the reference to the Solomon Jesus soul, the birth of whom is described in the Matthew gospel. So in the Matthew gospel, it is the pupils of Zarathustra that are the kings that are following the star. The name Zarathustra means golden star. So they are following a star to come to the reincarnation of their master and their teacher. So this is the Solomon Jesus child. In the Luke gospel, the mystery for me gets much deeper and trying to explain it in the spur of the moment is not gonna be easy. So I would just like to say that the Nathan Jesus soul is connected to a being that had not incarnated yet. And so, or, or ever, potentially, just gonna leave that right there. In the mystery, what I understand as occurs is that in the 12th year, the Solomon Jesus child dies. And the Zarathustra ego that has occupied that being, I'll use the word incorporates into the Nathan Jesus child. And this is evidenced by the description of the point when uh, the child is taken to the temple and when Mary and Joseph leave, they see that he's not with them and they go back to the church and they find him speaking with and teaching the church leaders and the doctors. So this is something that happens in the 12th year. And then, yeah, maybe I'm going too far away. Um, at the baptism, then this being, this mighty being of Zarathustra that had mm, <laughs> incarnated through the Solomon child, incorporated through the Nathan soul, then in the 30th year in the baptism in the River Jordan. These are deep mysteries. I really don't want to be sloppy here. Uh, makes way for the Christ being to incarnate. So I felt compelled to share a little bit of a picture about the two Jesus children in order to answer this question about the relationship of the star Capella to the Nathan Jesus. But I'm a feel, feeling a little bit uh, as though I'm in deep water right now. So just bear with me. Um, in Brian's research, he was pointing to the winter hexagon of stars. And there was a relationship that he drew between the star Sirius and Zarathustra. And he was in an experience of actually looking at the night sky and asking a question. It rose up in him that potentially the star Capella, which is also one of the brightest stars in the sky and particularly in the winter sky, stands on the opposite side of Gemini from Sirius could be related to the Nathan soul and that the two stars, Castor and Pollux that are the twins could potentially represent the two Jesus children and that Sirius is connected to Zarathustra and Capella connected to the Nathan soul. So I'm hoping that you can appreciate the, the deep esotericism of this mystery and why I'm not speaking it as beautifully as it deserves or warrants and um, uh, this article that Marty shared with me was from the Star Wisdom Calendar from a few years ago. I'm not sure that it's readily available, but maybe it is. Um, so thanks for that question. I hope that that was clear. So the star Capella, it shows up in the Greek myth as Amalthea, the she-goat that suckles Zeus. It shows up in the Hindu tradition as Brahma, the creator god. And through Brian Gray's sacred research, it shows up in relationship to the Nathan Jesus child. That was a big one. <laughs> I hope Kathleen that that answered your question. Um, okay. Yes, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for asking. Yeah. Would anyone else like to make a comment or have a question? This is a lot of content on a Saturday afternoon. 
And I also right now am wanting to ask each of us to, to um, I don't know how to ask this question. I'm a little bit, I, I could say, I get unsettled about sharing deep esoteric content online. And particularly when it's being recorded and I have agreed to do it. Um, and I am mindful that there is potential consequence that I don't yet see. And I just would ask all of us to put, just kind of hold that in our hearts that we are <laughs> entering into this space together out of our free will and using a technology that we haven't fully seen the consequence of it yet. And that the intention is to come together with goodwill and to really have gratitude toward the technology that allows us to meet because we wouldn't all be easily able to come together this way. And also then to hope that what can be shared here can nourish us and those beings that would seek this nourishment in a positive way, that it serves the human being and does not entrap us, does not entrap others, um, particularly in this season of the dead, that we have this free encounter. Rudolf Steiner is very specific about how we engage with those who have died in a free way, as though in, um, in the mood of the forces of dawn and dusk, where there's free encounter so that they, there's not this trapping of energies. It looks like... Um, hey, um, Mary, um, I, I put you a question in the chat about the proximity of the eclipse to the star Menkar, which is in the, the head of the whale, Ketus the whale, uh -huh. right? And uh, the whale being the largest living creature and some people think that the whale ketus represents large organic functions like the environment and the internet or just any, you know, any kind of organization. So I'm just wondering if you have any thoughts about that being the mouth. I mean, I think whales swim with their mouth open, don't they? I don't yeah, know. I think so. Yeah. You know, when I think about that region of the sky, the first thing that pops up for me is the story of Jonah and the whale. Oh, yeah. And how I think that that story is like to be swallowed by the whale is code speak for this moment at the midnight of the soul, which is happening between death and rebirth when the soul is making the decision to take up earthly incarnation again. And when we look in the sky, um, and I've usually pronounced it Cetus, so it's gonna be hard for me to say Cetus, but the Pisces Cetus superclusters that are just beyond that region of sky I imagine those as like the souls waiting to come to incarnation. And when the decision is made to take up incarnation, then you are swallowed by the whale. And when you read the description in the book of Jonah, what happens is once he's swallowed by the whale, okay, he's trying to avoid his destiny. He's hiding out from God who's told him he's got this task. And he gets on a boat and he goes to sleep below deck and the boat is tossed in a storm and the, the shipmates are trying to do everything they can to make sacrifice to their gods and try to calm the storm. And then they find him sleeping down below deck and they're like, what are you doing? We're at threat of losing our lives and you're sleeping. And he says, well, what is it that's going on? And they explain to him and he says, ah, it's my fault. It's my fault that this storm is happening. You have to throw me overboard. And they say, wait, wait, we don't want your blood on our hands. He says, no, trust me, this is gonna calm the storm. So he's thrown overboard and is swallowed by a whale that has been prepared for him by God. This is an essential part of it. He's swallowed by the whale. And then he has a vision of the future temple. That's the body. And a vision of the, the karmic task that he's going to undertake. So being swallowed by the whale is code speak for taking up earthly incarnation. So it had not occurred to me that it is close to, to the head of the whale, but I feel like it, maybe it's, it's connected to that. Like, like it's not just that oh, uh, uh, a mighty incarnation is about to take place, but even an idea can, can be like a conception and bring something into birth. And we are in that kind of a time where new thoughts want to be realized, but we have to be steady and quiet in ourselves to receive that, that positive listening as we encounter this threshold of this time so that's 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 great yeah that's really great thank you yeah. thanks thanks for asking okay so let's see um uh let's see 
Okay, Andre is asking everybody to raise your hand. When I listen to Lucy, it takes me to raise. Okay. Is anyone in your group looking at the original foundation stone, the double dodecahedron with pyrites? In answer to Nicola, yes. Um, yes, we are looking at the original double dodecahedron. Um, so just to, to share with everyone, if you, if you don't know, <clears throat> the original um, foundation stone was a, a double dodecahedron formed in copper and hanging in, in and they were two different sizes, a smaller, a smaller dodecahedron and a larger one oriented in the space such that the smaller one was to the west, the larger one to the east. Um, and the dodecahedron is really an interesting form. I can't say that this is why Rudolf Steiner did this, but what I have contemplated is that Johannes Kepler in the early 1600s, when he was teaching his students, um, he was struck with an, an idea. And he was teaching about the basic solids as they are, uh, the platonic solids as they're referred to. And he came to the idea that if he nested the solids one within the other and then calculated the surface area and the distance between them, that he could predict the orbits of the planets in our planetary system. So we have to imagine Kepler, he's working at a time when the Copernican thought is still trying to take hold. And he was an assistant to Tycho Brahe and Tycho really wanted him to, to accept his concept of the planetary system. But in his own research, Kepler had to side with, with Copernicus. And so he has this epiphany that he can project and predict the orbital rhythms of the planets by looking at the harmony of relationship between the platonic solids when they're nested one in another. And the one that predicted the earth orbit, so he's still trying to look for the rhythm of that orbit is the dodecahedron. And so I don't know that this is what informed Rudolf Steiner's decision about the form, the actual geometric form of the foundation stone, but it is a beautiful thought that it's in harmony with the rhythm of earth motion but also being mindful that the Copernican idea about and the laws that describe the motion of the earth around the sun have in them kind of these abdicating forces where the earth is uh, sort of relinquishing its self-directing forces. And we have to be mindful about the description of the motion of our cosmos that we don't diminish the earth's conscious relationship to the sun and the mutuality of that experience, which I think is really expressed in Kepler's description of how the planets are not moving in circles, but in ellipses. And they're not moving around, they're moving around a focal point rather than something that's just at the center of the ellipse. And what this means, because in an ellipse, which is a squash circle, and I'm not a mathematician, so I'm explaining this as a person from the humanities, but a squashed circle, an ellipse, like an oval, and there will be two focal points and the sun occupies one of those focal points and the planets go around it. And as they get closer to the sun, they move faster and the further away they are, they go slower. And that this is described mathematically as a continual alteration of the radius vector, which is a line drawn from the orbiting, the body being orbited and the body orbiting it. The alteration of that line, the continual alteration of that line, in my understanding says, oh, these two are having a conscious relationship. It's alive, it's engaged at every moment. Earth is not just orbiting the sun because of gravitational force and it doesn't have a choice. It's in a relationship. I mean, this is true of our social organism. We aren't living in a time where an external agency can guide and direct the free human being. And how do we arrive at a social organism that truly reflects that? We have to awaken in our concepts about our planetary system, these wakeful relationships, because that's a foundation for our consciousness in the world. And I see that, and maybe that's a lot to say, but the foundation stone, it's a dodecahedron. This is in harmony with earth orbit in its relationship with the sun. That gives a foundation for realizing myself as an individual and in communal relationship in the world. That doesn't diminish my agency, nor does it diminish the community. How do we get to that? And so the foundation stone as a meditation then also bears a relationship to this dodecahedral form. And you could say that in the first three panels, the call to the human soul from the, the, the father being in the heights to the depths, the 
Christ will in the encircling round. And then from the depths to the heights, this creates the, the, um, the structure of the Pentagon, the five pointed star. And so that really informs this, uh, the dodecahedron is a 12 sided object. Every flat surface is a Pentagon. Okay, this is, a, this is another lecture all in and of itself, but thank you for asking. I hope I touched your question there. Uh, Robin asked in the chat, I see that there are two hands being raised. Robin was there first in the chat. Mary, how does all of what we are looking at also come together with the stars once spoke to man? It is also coming to its 100th birthday. We are beginning. Okay, this is a big question. I'm just going to share that I'm going to talk about this with the um, Mistech group in December. I will touch the touch it right now, but this is also essential because this 100th year, uh, the the 100 year rhythm, I think, is really important in terms of something come to something that comes to maturity, and we're we're uh, being given an opportunity now to to realize to realize the fullness of an anthroposophical impulse. Let me just say that. But then I want to share that when Rudolf Steiner gave to Marie Steiner, the stars spoke once to man verse, it was Christmas day, 1922. One week later, there was the fire that destroyed the first Gertiano. Okay, I don't know whether that verse given to her was made public before her correspondence with Rudolf Steiner was published on the 100th anniversary of her birth in 1967. So 100 years after her birth, the correspondence is published, that verse is there. I've been trying to find out if she kept this verse to herself, held it in her heart, or whether it was made public. Maybe she shared it with some friends, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure. But I think that this is significant because you're given a verse by a spiritual initiate. And if you take it into your heart, and then we look at what happened. One week later, the fire happened that destroyed the first Gertianum. A year later, to the day, Rudolf Steiner brought the foundation stone meditation as a way that we as human beings speak to the stars. And he says about this meditation, that the proper soil into which it can be laid is the human heart. So the question I have is, can we see that the, the star spoke once to man verse is a precedent for the foundation stone meditation? The star spoke once to man is expressed in the foundation stone as the first three panels with the call of the spiritual world to the human soul. This is the stars speaking to the human being. The world destiny moment when the stars go silent is the incarnation of the Christ being because now we can no longer take direction from outside. It has to come from the I am realized within and that this is going to take time to develop and the human being realizing the silencing of the stars is going to come to recognition ultimately that we are now speaking to the stars. And he says this, gives this to Marie Steiner at Christmas 1922 saying at the end, we can become aware of how we are speaking to the stars. One year later, he speaks to the stars in the foundation stone meditation by honoring the how the stars call to the human being in the first three panels, the turning point in time when the stars go silent, and then in the end at the coda, now the human being speaks, O light divine, O son of Christ, warm thou our hearts, enlighten thou our heads. So my question then is, when Marie Steiner was given this verse, uh, how is it, is it possible, is it appropriate to imagine that she was holding it in her heart such that when we come to the Christmas conference a year later, Rudolf Steiner can say something that the proper soil into which the foundation stone is laid is the soil of the human heart. Something had to germinate in a human heart. If this is being taken through an initiation process by a spiritual initiate. So I, it's a big question, Robin, but that's Oh, that's also really important. And I will, I'm going to talk about that more. Um, I think this program will be online. It's um, December, the, a Sunday in December, early December, the 8th or 9th. I can't remember the date. You're talking about it at FRAC too, if I remember right. Okay. And I think Andrew's here. I don't know if he's still online. Andrew Linnell might know the date of that event, but yeah. 
So I'll, I'll talk about it a little bit more. Okay, Nicola, you have your hand raised. Thank you for being patient. I was actually just gonna put it into the chat um, to say that we have a, a sacred mathematics research group in Emerson College in the UK. And it would be great if we could be in touch about this original foundation stone because I've tried in Europe and I couldn't find any. I'm a Pythagorean mathematician, so no, I uh, hope I didn't make a, a bunch of mistakes there. No, no, no. It was beautiful the way you described that. It was <laughs> absolutely right. Py Pythagorean mathematics is are those things which have been learned through the wisdom of love. That is the original. <laughs> You go back to the etymology and you see that Pythagoras and Theano. Anyway, there's, obviously, I, I'm not going to go into all that now. But anyway, so, um, yeah, I, I was a couple of years ago, I was trying to find through like the, the, the European anthroposophical mathematicians. I couldn't find anybody. I mean, the last person I could find who worked on this um, was wonderful George Adams. Uh -huh, uh -huh. It's really brilliant. I mean, I'm just all I'm saying is it would be lovely if we could be in touch somehow. I would really like to know. Um, obviously, as in especially I will, I will put my email address in the chat. Um, Great. Thank you. OK, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, yeah. I can... this is so important. It's so beautiful. I mean, that's it. The original Gertianum, the original foundation stone and how that transforms into the foundation stone meditation is clearly um, very, very important for us now. So yes, thank it, it really is. And I, I have to say that I was driving along in my car, just saying in myself, why Rudolf Steiner? Why a dodecahedron? Yeah. And why call the meditation the same thing? Like, what is that? And it, it, it was a picture rose up. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh. It's also the pyrites inside the dodecahedron. Yeah, yeah, I don't know enough about that to be able yeah, to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, well, well, obviously we can we can communicate because there's. Yeah, so I put my email address oh, there. That's super. Thank you very much. Thank God you. Bless. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Leon, I'm going to ask you to unmute. There you go. Hi, Mary. Uh, hello, hello. First of all, I'd like to offer a word of appreciation for a few answers back when you spoke about the relatively relativistic nature of the solar system. Uh -huh. It's not just one central controlling element that is the center. It, you can organize this system in any way that works for you. And that's beautiful the way you said that. Um, secondly, um, I want to make a mention as a zoologist, and uh -huh. a zoologist who was trained at Oxford, where I had to learn Latin to get in, okay? And uh, I was told when I learned Latin that the hard sea, Cetus, or Cetacean, or Cephalopod, or all these words are imagined as correct because of poetry. Uh -huh. and, and it's perfectly okay that in America we soften it. But I, as a habit, have to say river viscimus. <laughs> <laughs> so that's all. <laughs> yeah, thank you. So two things I would like to say to that. And one is in thinking about our planetary system and that, that I think what you said was that we could organize it however we like. I would suggest to us that in, and this is just going way out there, but I just have to say, for me, when Rudolf Steiner is describing a healthy social organism and the threefold nature of that organism, this is rooted in a deep understanding of the relationships in our celestial and planetary system. And that when we can get to that, and I think that they're, they're, uh, it's not that everybody has to understand the planetary system at the same moment that they understand the threefold social organism, but there do have to be those that are doing that work to bring the thought about our planetary system so that we can change up our social organism. It's gonna take that, it's gonna take that. And then the other thing, um, 
<laughs> you made me think of is that Rudyard Kipling wrote this beautiful fairy tale, How the Whale Got His Throat. And oh, it's a good. really fun story. And in having it in the background of this idea of like Jonah and the whale, and then also the human being coming toward incarnation, it's really fun to read that, that tale that way. So thank you. So somebody also said about whales uh, swimming with their mouths open. And I wanted to mention that there are two kinds of whales, basically the baleen whales and the sperm whales. And the baleen whale includes the largest animal on the earth, the blue whale. Uh -huh. It can't swallow anything larger than an orange because it filters plankton. And these believe well, if you read Rudyard Kipling, you'll know why. <laughs> so thank oh. you, Sandra, for putting it in the chat that they're called Just So Stories. And also thank you, Marty, for pointing out that Peter Selg speaks about the Pyrites in his book. Did you put the name of the book in response to a question from Aaron Fried Pfeiffer? Um, Okay, so I'm. If you have the name of the book, I would like to say it. But uh, okay, thank you. M Marty is saying to me this might be a place for Nicola and I to have a conversation about what the what those writing. Yeah. It's, Thanks, it's, Marty. It's, it's, I'm sorry. I was trying to type, and I can't type and talk at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> the um, it's the destiny of the Michael community, foundation stone of for the future, by Peter Selg, and he's the only place I've seen where the pyrite crystals are spoken about like that. There's more okay. um, information too. He says um, also the, it's about the mystery of the sulfur and the, um, I forgot the um, iron and the sulfur. Can you say too. the title of the book again? The Destiny of the Michael Community, Foundation Stone of the Future. Okay. Yeah, it Thank has you. two lectures in it. And that's yeah. one of them. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. <sighs> this has been very rich. I thank you, everyone. Um, is there any other comment or question that anyone would like to share? Okay. Then I think, Jonathan, that is it. Yeah. The season is really sacred. It's my hope that everything that we shared really nourishes those who are across the threshold and that uh, it nourishes us as we move through this time. And that if you bump your head on a tree, you got a friend right there to lend you a hand and say, hey, that's okay. I've done the same thing myself. <laughs> we'll make it, we'll make it. Absolutely, thank you very, very much. I, at this moment, uh, well, no, I'll, I'll again formally thank you, Mary, for a wonderful presentation and everyone for participating. Uh, yeah, it's it's been an excellent discussion. Thank you. And, and now I'll stop the recording.